the north, south, east, west thing. <laughs> you, you know those religious people, very concerned about their geography. That's right. Welcome to Recotopia, a happy home for recommended movies, shows, and music from two people you can definitely trust. Trustability varies by region, no guarantee is implied. Now, here are your hosts, Chris Atkinson and Jeremy Scott. One more funny remark from you, Buster. Well, let's get out of oh, here. Oh, please, please don't argue anymore. You heard everybody's... Look, we figured it 17 different ways. And every time we figured it, it was no good. Because no matter how we figured it, somebody didn't like the way we figured it. Hello, everybody. How hey. are y'all doing? How are you doing today? It is uh, episode 96 of Recotopia. I'm Chris Atkinson, and uh, how are you two guys doing? I'm doing well. How about you, Aaron? I am I am here. I am conscious and, uh, and doing very well. Thank you. <laughs> Jeremy Scott and Aaron Dice are with us, and we also have our chat here with us today. One person thinks that I'm four foot six. I don't know if I can confirm or deny that rumor. Uh, but, I, blew, uh, I, blew, I, I have to say this since we're talking about height. I blew my wife's mind yesterday by telling her Elizabeth Debicki was 6'3". Oh, she, yeah. She had no clue how tall uh, she was, and there was the whole let Elizabeth Debicki be tall movement that I, that I support in uh, uh, that's going on. On, but it's it's so funny what movies can do to to change that because we were watching the crown she's princess die on the crown mm -hmm. yeah princess die was tall, tall but she was not that tall no she's a goddess or as the british would say a goddess yes <laughs> um but uh anyway today's uh big recommend is going to be it's a mad 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 world from 1963 but uh we will start off with our small recommends anybody got any small recommends to talk about today it's no big deal <laughs> It's so small and light. It's small, it's tiny, it's petite, it's wee. Well, I have a non-movie, non-food small recommend, and I mm. emailed this small recommend to Chris the day after I discovered it a couple weeks ago, and now I'm sharing it with the world, especially if you have cats, and it is the cheerful, self-moving cat toy ball. <laughs> All right, so I've, I've got quite, one in my Quite a name. Here, and you just <laughs> oh, you remove this, tiny. this little rubber mm. thing. It's the size of a golf ball, uh, yeah. and it charges... USB, and so then you turn it on and it moves by itself. So like if I shake it, well, there it goes. You hear that on my desk? It's mm -hmm. bouncing all over the place, propelling itself. I don't know what the voodoo technology is inside this thing. Uh, and there are several other brands. I don't know who's knocking off who. Uh, this is the one I bought. That's why I'm recommending it. My cats are mesmerized by this thing. It was billed to me as something they would play with. It moves by itself, and then it stops for a little and turns yellow. And if a cat comes up to it and bats it when it's yellow, it turns red again and starts running away. My cats don't bat at it. They just stare at it and follow <laughs> it all around the house and stare <laughs> at it mm -hmm. and as i said to chris in my email if your cats ever are all up in your shit and you're trying to do something this is this is the only thing i found that reliably consistently over and over again gets them out of my hair for 30 to 45 minutes uh this model i guess there's a newer model that does better on carpet this model will sometimes spin in place on carpet, uh, but then an hour later it'll work itself free and I'll hear it banging across the hallway again. Whatever this costs, it's worth 10 times what I paid for it in the freedom I've received from my cats up in my shit. It, I bought <laughs> Cheerful Ball M1 on Amazon. I can't recommend it enough. There you go. I bought something <laughs> similar for my children uh, a few years back, uh, and it, it worked in much the same way. <laughs> was it called a Nintendo Switch? <laughs> Kept them occupied. No, it was actually a drone that was like self-propelling and would come back to you and, you oh, know, cool. whatever, and it would just fly around the room. I mean, it had like 10 minute flight time or whatever before it had to be re recharged, but, um, <laughs> but yeah, it would keep them occupied in much the same way. Uh, so yeah, I, I highly recommend. Uh, my small recommend is Wonka. Number one no movie at, th at the box office. I didn't think there was any chance this was good. <laughs> you know, you, you're not alone. I've heard that from a lot of people. And I think that's this, when it 
a movie like this happens, what's interesting is I think most of us go into it going, there's no way this is possibly good, whatever. And then it's actually kind of good. And so because of expectations, you're like, I love this movie. Mm. Uh, and so there's, I think it's like an 85% on Rotten Tomatoes on top critics. Um, so like it's certainly the critical acclaim is there. Um, I really enjoyed it. I'm, I am apt to enjoy musicals. I think there is the Paddington effect here. It's the same guy who did the Paddington movies and you mm. can feel that warmth and heart in here and it just works. I actually teared up three times during this movie. Uh, mm. That's how, how good he is at just kind of bringing the humanity into something. Um, one of the main complaints I've heard is that this Wonka doesn't feel anything like Wonka is supposed to be, like, which is, you know, kind of this, uh, you know, embittered, you know, person. But I think this is a good origin story for that character. Like, you can see how he would go from this character, not trying to give a lot away about, you know, what this character has happened to him in this movie. Uh, but you can see how he would go from the person in this movie to the Gene Wilder type uh, character. So um, I really, really like this. Um, um, so yeah, I enjoyed it. So I've been loving late career Hugh Grant for the last four or five years. Yes. But I just read last week in an interview promoting this movie, he finds acting excruciating. He like, hates it so much. He hates it. <laughs> and it, it, it makes me sad to know that because it feels like, like, especially in Paddington 2 and Dungeons and Dragons, Honor Among Thieves, it feels like he's having a blast, but mm -hmm. apparently it's the exact opposite. Same really here. Sad. feels like he's having a blast here, and he clearly did not. He did not enjoy all the Oompa Loompa makeup. That just and... makes him an even better actor, I guess. I guess. I guess, he, yeah. He ended the interview basically saying, I just hope my kids like this one, whereas, like, I guess the Paddington 2 scared the bejesus out of him or something. Oh, uh, interesting. They didn't like seeing him be the villain, whereas here mm. he'll be the Oompa Loompa, which is less scary to their kids. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Anyway. I, I imagine the second wave of people seeing this will be, no, it's actually bad. I imagine that's the second wave that's coming because that's usually how it goes because then the expectations go up and then because it's only kind of good, then it's like, eh, whatever, you know, it was bad or whatever. Mm. But I don't know. Everybody has their own experience. My experience was great. I really enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, my uh, small recommend is Dream Scenario uh, starring Nicolas Cage. Mm. Um, I'm curious about this movie. Yeah, this movie um, is 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 quite a lot of fun, and I think it has some things to say too. So everybody in this world, well, not everybody, not quite everybody in this world, is having dreams about Nicolas Cage. Not, and this isn't meta. This is he's a, just a normal dude in this. He's not Nicolas Cage. Um, although in some ways you can kind of <laughs> you can still kind of be like it's Nicolas Cage. Um, but. Uh, but there's there are people who are having dreams about him but they're the 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 thing about it is they're so ordinary uh in 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 the fact that how he shows up they're almost always a situation when the person is in danger and he shows up and does nothing in the dream he does absolutely nothing and that is what every dream is like and he start he's a professor at this college his class starts getting popular because all these people start having these shared experiences of having him in the dream there's a whole montage of people talking about their dreams where they're in trouble and danger like like bleeding out or whatever and he just shows up in the dream just stands there and and that's it that's the end of the dream um he becomes famous enough that he's thinking, oh, well, I might be able to write this book about, and he, he write he teaches something like biology or, or something like that. And that's a, that's his subject that he wants to teach. He wants to write this book about it. And he's all, he already thinks that uh, one of his ideas has been stolen by somebody he used to be with and that, you know, that they've taken his stolen, his thunder and everything. And he hopes that he's going to be able to write this book. And the very, uh, he finally actually does uh, encounter some people who want to do something with them, but they don't really want to do anything having to do with a biology book or anything like that. They want to put him in like, uh, a, like, like Coke commercials or something like, I can't remember <laughs> the exact brand, but, the, but it's basically like, Oh, everybody's got this shared feeling of this guy being 
in their dreams and everything. Why doesn't he show up in a Coke commercial or whatever? And it's like, you know, the drink of your dreams or whatever like that. Michael Sarah plays the, the head of this uh, agency or whatever, and he's hilarious in it. It's exactly how those meetings go, by the way, where you give them ideas and they just kind of like nod at you like, yeah, yeah, okay, let me, let me write some notes down about that or whatever. There happens to be one person there who is having different kinds of dreams about mm. Nicolas Cage though and and those are sexy dreams and <laughs> at this point that a a certain uh, uh certain set of events occurs where once this is over he starts coming in and terrorizing people in their dreams there's a turning point after this is discovered and once he starts terrorizing people in his dreams everything that he thinks is going his way starts going downhill and there are some discussions about cancel culture and things like that in this movie uh i know that is kind of a charged term but I think it has some thoughtful things to say about cancel culture in it. I don't think it's one of those where it's going on, on bad faith or anything like that, but this is a very, very good movie. Um, uh, Nicholas cage talk about somebody who's had a great late, late career Renaissance or Renaissance or whatever you want to call it. Uh, I think dream scenario is a, is another one. And if you've been liking him in the, in the movies the past five years, he's just great in this. Too. I think he's awesome. phenomenal in this. I think it's one of his best performances. I think he's really, really, good here mm -hmm. um i think the the that metaphor uh about fame it's a real fame kind of like when you there's this whole thing at the beginning of the movie about zebras right and this mm -hmm. idea that you know the the stripes on a zebra are to camouflage it to each other not to the world mm -hmm. around it so that it just right. looks like one big mass because when you stick your head up out of the herd that's when you can get attacked and so that's the entire metaphor of the movie is all of a sudden he has stuck his head up out of the herd and what happens to him because of that and it is a commentary on fame culture and and those kind of things and i think as as that it this movie is great it works you know as that really 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 well so mm -hmm. um and it's just it's a really interesting movie and that that's there's a scene involving the young woman uh who finds him sexually attractive in her jeans that may be the cringiest most amazing scene i i saw all year it was it's, yes. it's so good it it speaks to something i don't know that i've ever seen a movie speak to so clearly uh mm -hmm. in that scene it's um, kind of in a way like groundhog day where bill murray yes, is trying to exactly recreate that. the yes. andy mcdowell stuff when they're throwing the snowballs and everything yes. it's kind of yeah. like that so. it's, it's similar to that yeah it's yeah. it's so good you guys have officially um, bumped this up my list. <laughs> <laughs> it's also you, a, this is such a Jeremy movie. Yeah. This is such, yeah. I, I also believe this is slightly based on a true story. I know that's, that sounds ridiculous, but I believe oh, this really? was a true phenomenon that happened with someone uh, where there was a, a, a mass delusion of dreaming of them kind of thing that this is kind of uh, jumps off. It was of, Max so. Headroom. It was indeed. Yeah, yeah Max Clearly. Headroom. Okay. <laughs> Um, a dream scenario, I think, is in theaters right now. I don't know if it's streaming yet. Um, I saw it in theaters two or three weeks ago, I believe. But it should be soon. I'm assuming it's soon. It'll be on some sort of streaming service. So um, check 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 your real goods. Check your you know check your apps that that tell you all the things and stuff. You know. Anyway. Um. All right. So the uh, big recommend uh, for this episode. I'm fine. I'm fine. It's just that you're so big. It's so huge. It's a good rule, but this is bigger than rules. It's bigger on the inside. Is it? I noticed. Uh, it's a mad, 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 mad world. I did leave out a mad when I said it the first time. Someone called me out on it. And it's funny to me. The director, Stanley Kramer, wanted to put a fifth mad, apparently, in this title. They just kept adding them. <laughs> and didn't put the fifth mad in it. And apparently he regretted it. <laughs> <laughs> um, Stanley Kramer uh, is a director we haven't talked about much, and I don't know why, because he had a legendary run there from the 50s and 60s especially. And uh, he had done movies like uh, The Defiant Ones and Inherit the Wind and Judgment at Nuremberg. And Spencer Tracy has been a part of a lot of these movies that he, he directed. Um, and maybe his most famous movie is Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, which came out later. Mm. But 
Um, but um, it, he wanted to make a movie that was not serious at all. Um, he had made so many just dead serious movies and everything. So he wanted to finally do this. And apparently he tried to get everybody funny that he could possibly find in this movie. Some people couldn't do it because of scheduling conflicts. Some people couldn't do it because they asked for too much money. And there's other reasons that certain people were not in this. But man, they got a lot <laughs> of people in this uh, ultimately. So uh, unfamiliar with the story. So here you go. Uh, a man by the name of Smiler Grogan, played by Jimmy Durant, uh, is speeding through these through a little highway system uh, on a cliff. And he is going way, way too fast and uh, ends up uh, his car ends up going over the cliff. And there are four interested parties who find who go down and check and see if he's okay. He just happens to be still alive on this cliff. They come down and walk, walk down to it. And uh, so who do we have who all come down here? We have Milton Burrow playing J. Russell Finch. He's a seaweed food business owner of some sort. They decided to give him the weeniest thing possible because that's kind of what he is mm -hmm. in this movie. He's a weenie. He, he, he's a very agreeable about everything and he's got a very young wife uh, uh named emmeline played by dorothy provine but uh the the person who really is just like uh just just the person who probably has whittled him down over the years is his mother-in-law mrs marcus played by ethel merman mm. um who is uh constantly yelling through this movie <laughs> constantly yelling about something she never dials it down it's kind of funny um <laughs> um <laughs> then we have another group but it's a couple sid caesar plays melville crump who is a dentist and his wife monica played by edie adams i believe this was supposed to be ernie kovacs at one point Edie Adams was married to Ernie Kovacs, but Ernie Kovacs died in a car crash months before mm. filming. Uh, and um, she, I th think she had to get, had to be talked into doing this movie. She ended up saying this would be the right thing to do. So she did. Um, they're a couple that's, uh, that's uh, driving to some place. And then you have Mickey Rooney who plays Ding Bell. I don't think this is ever like uh, actually stated in the movie that his name is Ding Bell. Uh, but that's what it happened. once. Does he say it once? Okay, I, think I don't he know. Says it once. <sighs> okay, and then uh, his buddy, Buddy ha Buddy Hackett, plays Benji Benjamin. Um, <laughs> and uh, the and then finally we have the one loner of the group, Pike, played by Jonathan Linters. He's a truck driver. He has got a whole bunch of furniture and things in his in his truck um they go down uh to see uh, uh what's uh, if smiler grogan is okay he's on he's definitely about to die in fact he literally kicks a bucket at one point uh down the down the cliff but before he dies he says does this dough see 350 g's and uh they uh they uh t he tells them that it's under this big w in santa rosita park and i don't know if santa i don't think santa rosita is a real place but apparently it's close to san diego in the mm. um so um so they he tells them about that just before he dies we have cops coming down one is played by norman fell of three's company fame if you ever watched that he came he came into that later um he asked them if the, he said anything or whatever. I think there was a really funny, there's a funny line where Jonathan Winter says about what? And he goes, what do you mean about what? <laughs> and it's like, did he say anything? Um, and, um, and so they kind of stumble around and they don't reveal that they've been told about this, this month. So they go up, they, they all pretend like they're going to go. They, they, after they get done with the cops, they all pretend like they're going to, um, they all pretend like they're going to just go their separate way and do this do their vacations or wherever they're going and everything but nobody really kind of nobody really trusts that and for a second there all four of the cars are just driving it single file down this highway making sure one doesn't do something out of the ordinary at some point it's i think it's milton burl the the finch character who's pushed to go faster or is it is it sid caesar i can't remember which one which one it was it's pushed to go faster and they all go after him because they're like all right he's gonna go after that money so everybody's kind of like on edge they all want to go for the money uh i don't know what jonathan winters is doing he bat he slows down and he stays behind 
I don't know what he's actually trying to do there. I don't, maybe you guys have an idea. I mean, my, of, my guess was that he was trying to fall behind and then find his own route to try and get there faster. I uh, guess, but I, but it, it all seems to be set up to be a joke basically where he stops and then he creeps around the rock. And of course, all of them are just standing there like, <laughs> what are you doing? And when he tries to explain, he even he even's like he's he's about to say what he's about he's, he, he was doing, but then he doesn't say it. So I don't think they even had an answer, really. I mean, maybe maybe he wanted to back up at some point. I don't he knew uh, he knew he couldn't win any kind of, <clears throat> you know, race in that truck he was in. So he was going to try to find a different route. I think that's all it was. Yeah, just turn around then um <laughs> he stops his truck yeah. uh so okay so then there's there's a okay let's all be reasonable right let's let's actually like decide how this is going to be divvied up when we get when we find the money and everything and they first it's a very reasonable thing it's let's split it up amongst the cars but every time they bring something up they're just like nobody likes it because they're like i don't get as much as this person does and so on and so forth when we come back to them there's a there's this movie starts intercutting between a lot of stories at this point because we 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 go to spencer tracy and we see what he's doing but at some point they're they were they want to do a thing where it's like whoever went down the hill and uh whoever was in the car and and each car gets a share and the person <laughs> in the car gets the share and uh it's, they uh they there's the only sensible one is, is ethel merman's like let's just split it eight ways which is would have been the perfect thing but they don't they just they just don't trust her because she's a woman and they keep yeah. calling her an old bag and all this other stuff and buddy hackett's like we figured it 17 different ways and every time we figured it it was no good and <laughs> so they get and so it keeps and, and they're like so now it's every man including the old bag for himself and this is my favorite part <laughs> of the movie uh, uh mickey rooney says except you lady may you just drop dead and then jonathan <laughs> winters comes in and says all right all right we all agree on that <laughs> <laughs> This movie um, hates that woman's character. It, it does, and she a lot of a, a lot of the humor comes not only from her, her from her constant criticizing and everything, but she falls over and doubles over several times in this movie. Like this, I think there's like five or six times she falls over, ass over tit, as they say, or is held the, upside down to shake the keys out of her bosom. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> um, uh, so. Uh, yeah, at some point uh, we have this, we so we cut to um, the police detective, the main police detective, uh, T. G. Culpepper, who's played by Spencer Tracy. He's about to retire. He wants a bigger pension for himself, but also he's hoping to take down the Smiler Grogan case, which is a tuna factory robbery. It's a three hundred and fifty thousand dollar tuna factory robbery. Um, uh, and uh, and so he wants to take down the Smiler Grogan case uh, just before he retires. He hasn't even worked on it doesn't he tell his wife's been working on it for like two decades 15 years he's and been this working guy's driving on this. around with cash in his car that's wild yeah i know i know um and uh it's, he wants to take this case down now if you've seen any movie you know why he wants to take this down you and and they've and they spur they they intersperse a lot of like moments where he's kind of daydreaming you see him looking at mexico on the map and all that in the longer version which by the way that's a whole other discussion uh about this movie the longer version which they have tried to piece together lost footage over the years and everything you actually see him planning about this when he talks to buster keaton who gets kind of short shrift in this movie uh when they actually do show buster keaton you may have blinked and missed him in fact uh that's uh how how little he is in the two and a half hour version there's there's uh there's a lot of like uh uh negatives to watching either version and there's positives to watching either version but but I, you know. I agree. I, I watched both versions and this, this is the most prep I've ever done for a movie on this show. Uh, you know, six mm -hmm. hours of movie watching or whatever, but, uh, but I did watch both versions and we can have an, uh, a discussion on the differences and such, but I think it boiled down to me was the longer version. The positive is you get a lot better motivations for a lot of the actions. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. there, there are motivations in the shorter version that you don't like. I couldn't understand that I understood in the longer version. Right, and and it has some interesting like artifacts, like the police calls at the intermission. Like I don't mm -hmm. know, like there are police calls that they played at the theater, like over yeah. all the speakers during the intermission. So like it would update you on like the different sections of the movie, how it was going while you were on intermission. That's kind of interesting mm -hmm. and fun. So yeah. yeah. 
Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and and yes, you, you get the full widescreen uh, version of it, which, yes. you know, the two and a half version, half an hour version is the pan and scan, which has cut out actual entire characters uh, on the screen. Um, uh, I don't know how much that that damaged the movie for me once I watched the longer version and I, and I was able to see the difference and everything. The Three Stooges thing is pretty egregious, though. Um, it's crazy there's a whole stooge left out on the pan and scan version left out on the pan and scan so, so yeah i watched uh somebody on the discord found this on youtube mm -hmm. uh and it was two and a half two hours and 39 minutes 35 yeah minutes. there are there are two and a half hour versions that have the full uh and I, framing. all three stooges were there for yeah. me and mm -hmm. i was more offended by how little time they spent on set for this movie uh, because <laughs> if i had been looking the wrong direction not directly at the screen for those three seconds i would have missed them um but they were all there for the version that i saw yeah mm -hmm. yeah. yeah um the basically the decision at the police station is we're going to follow these four groups of people we're not going to arrest them we're going to we're going to see where they go and uh and then we'll arrest them once they start digging up this place where smiler grogan told them to. so these four groups the first stop is an airfield the crumps win the old beat up plane that they've gone to go to. They think that they're going to be able to fly to Santa Rosita in this plane and beat everybody. Of course, this plane is a death trap. Um, <laughs> nobody should pay any money to fly in this plane. Uh, and there's even a point where they look down and they see the cars whizzing past them on the road <laughs> underneath them. So they aren't actually getting anywhere fast. Um, Although the, they do uh, arrive anyways, a, a, a long time before everybody else so that was interesting yeah that was interesting i mean i guess he does pay him pay the guy some money to go faster which is I guess, takes more fuel or whatever yeah that's uh, yeah that's it yeah uh but it's it's still like uh, the the timing of everybody getting there you know at the same time doesn't seem quite right but hey <laughs> it's, it's a movie that we're watching who cares right um so um so they've decided to follow the the people the first stop is an airfield crumps win the the plane it's built in 1916 by the way <laughs> he's old before he's about to get up there and one of the then this woman on the air field does the north south east west thing whatever. <laughs> yes that's what it is the north yes. south east west thing <laughs> <laughs> you, you know those religious people very concerned about their geography that's right. she that's draws right. the letter lowercase t on her chest <laughs> yes exactly the lowercase t that's what she does um so <laughs> The other three groups have to figure out what they're going to do. Of course, two of the groups, there's a wreck between Pike and the Finch clan. So their cars are completely out of the, out of the, out of the loop. And then Ding and Benji decide to drive to another airfield, like a private airfield, I guess. Yeah. Um, like high class kind of place. Yeah, high yeah. class one where they're going to run into Tyler Fitzgerald played by Jim Backus. Now, an interesting thing about this movie is that it came out, I guess, a month after Gilligan's Island premiered. So I think a lot of people at this point know Jim Backus is from Gilligan's Island as, as Thurston Howell the third but maybe not like it's not really entrenched in everybody at this point yet right. maybe it is yeah. I'm not I don't know but he he's kind of playing that same kind of person he's a he's a rich drunk and I don't know if that's what he was before you know he and, and he's just known for this and that's what he was always doing but they end up harassing this guy to get on get on his um now we're going back and forth Pike takes a child's bicycle out of his truck <laughs> and starts trying to he, he ends up running into this other motorist played by Otto Meyer. Uh, his name is Otto Meyer, played by Phil Silver. Um, Phil Silver's hears the story and then tricks Pike and drives off without him. And then uh, the Finch clan, they wave down uh, this British guy who's like a cactus wrangler of some sort. I don't know. He's, <laughs> he, he's, he's, he likes collecting cacti. Um, uh, his name is Jay Algernon Hawthorne. He's played by Terry Thomas, who's got an unusual name because Terry Thomas, you'd think that's two names, but it's a hyphenated Terry Tom. I don't know how that works. And then, so the the, the he was that, originally supposed the, to be Peter Sellers. Uh, yeah, who was, Peter Sellers, who was one of the ones mentioned for wanting too much money. Uh, yes. he, he did not want to do it uh, for what they were offering. So yeah. So there's a point where they're driving with him, and Mrs. Marcus remembers that she has a son that lives near Santa Rosita, and he and she slaps uh, Hawthorne on the back while he's driving. Of course, this leads to a 
giant wreck because everything that they do in this movie <laughs> ends up being a car wreck at some point and they have to go get his car fixed and they end up promising him 10 percent. at this point mrs marcus is trying to call her son sylvester who is a guess a beatnik of some sort he's a lifeguard um he the it's an it's one of the most unusual scenes in the movie it's this woman dancing in a bikini uh and it's just like this very straightforward like no emotion dance to something and sylvester's sitting there like yeah baby yeah and just because he's, he's like the most excited he's that someone could ever be at someone so stoically dancing um and sh they just don't hear the phone and for like a couple of times it takes like three times for her to get him on the phone finally anyway um that's much later in the movie um so <laughs> of course and we're going back to otto meyer the phil silvers character uh his he's he's driving away from pike because he just tricked him and everything but his tire blows and he goes to this garage and he goes out and tells the guys to do whatever they can to get his car back up and everything this lets pike come back and catch up with him and then there's this big fight where apparently jonathan winters did some damage to phil Silvers <laughs> in this fight he actually hurt him yeah. during this thing he slams oh. him up against this gas this like gas pump and like all sorts of stuff and and we start to we start to believe that pike is like in the incredible hulk or something in this movie because he has the strength of a hundred men oh he's for movie. sure the strong sensitive guy like he's the <laughs> yeah it's that's what he's supposed to be yes yes um uh at, at some point he gets the the garage mechanics to to hold on to him and they they wrap this uh barrier of some sort around him or whatever and he says he's a psychopathic killer there's going to be somebody that comes by to pick him up later and you know thanks guys or whatever and he drives off and this leads to pike destroying this gas station uh this is probably one of the most famous scenes of this movie uh because pike gets out of his restraints and he fights these garage mechanics and everything is just you know smash somebody through a wall or like punch through something and like the garage is not a garage at the end uh of this fight uh and uh pike ends up taking a tow truck uh out of this out of this thing and by the way i'm sure you've know you will notice that they probably do far more damage than 350 grand <laughs> in this movie to get 350 grand um by the end of it so let's see we have so okay so ding and benji they're trying to get uh they're trying to get uh tyler fitzgerald uh and so he's he's a drunk he they can't get him up at first they put him in a shower or he goes to take a shower or whatever he finally agrees to take him in the air but he's way more interested in drinking than flying the plane. That's going to lead, of course, um, with it, that he's going to end up going in. He's going to give the controls to Benji and he's going to go back and he's going to try to make an old fashioned. And, uh, and while, while Benji is trying to hold on to the, to the, to the wheel or the, whatever the, uh, yeah, he, uh, he, he actually makes the plane move in such a way that Tyler hits his head and he's unconscious. And now you have two people who don't know how to fly a plane flying a plane some of my favorite stuff is the them trying to land that plane in the uh the control room and then mm -hmm. just buzzing the control room stuff. like i think rob reiner's in the control room Carl and reiner or, yeah, sorry, Carl Reiner. Yes, yeah. uh, previous generation Reiner. Right. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I just, I found all of that really, really funny. Why don't we just shoot him down and be done with it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, I, I, I think I love this little, uh, little cut to Culpepper where he starts talking to his wife about flying to Hawaii and celebrate the retirement. And then they're not going to take their daughter, Billy Sue. Billy Sue is set to be engaged. Something happens to that. And she says, apparently the mom says, well, she's six foot five and that that's going to have that's going to have a certain problem with it or whatever <laughs> something like that um and uh billy sue is upset she's going to leave home she wants to get to a bus station she doesn't want to talk to her dad apparently doesn't like her dad very much and then later on billy sue's on the phone and his wife is on another and he has the phones pointed at each other so that she and her mom can talk while he just sits there and he's just like fuck my life basically i can't wait till i get this 350 g's and go to mexico basically the whole time this is one of the most curious parts of the movie is that otto inexplicably picks up a hitchhiker like knowing otto's character throughout this movie who's he may be the most deplorable person in all of them i think i'm surprised he even pulls over 
uh, honestly. Yeah. But he picks up a hitchhiker who wants to take medicine to his wife. He's broken down. He needs to take medicine to his wife. And then he takes the car off road and Otto can't get back up the hill. So he gets this kid to help him out of the area. And uh, he ends up driving up this mountain and then taking the car down this long slope. And there's and when he gets down there, there's nothing but a stream. And uh, the kid says it's shallow enough and just drive just drive over it. Of course, it's not shallow enough. And Otto gets the car into the stream and he just ends up floating away. And basically, I think he ends up like crashing somewhere and he's on foot uh, after that happens. And apparently, Silver's nearly died. He nearly drowned during this. Wow. This yeah, scene. apparently he can't swim. Yeah. Wow. Um, so that, that I mean, <laughs> people just get and give any fucks about what they did uh, to make movies. Uh, even back, even in this era of, of movies, yep. they're still Every, doing shit like that. Everyone was Tom Cruise back then. Just think of it that way. Yeah. Every Everyone <laughs> yes. was Tom Cruise. What's funny you <laughs> yeah. say that is that one of the notes that I wrote down in the trivia section of IMDb is that there were only about 100 stunt performers in the U.S. at this time, and 80 of them worked on this movie. <laughs> yes. Insane. Crazy. That's yeah. insane. Insane. So Pike is in the tow truck now. He ends up finding Mrs. Marcus and her daughter stranded on the side of the road. I'm kind of skipping over a little bit. Miss Marcus has a fight, and 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 Aaron alluded to it. They she puts the keys down in her dress because she wants to call Sylvester, and they don't. And then she, they like, <laughs> they just like hold her upside down to get the keys out. They don't go drive off somewhere. I think they still need to fix his truck. I guess I think that's what there's the, the, like the tires still loop wobbly on it. And so that's what they go do. So while so while uh, Mrs. Marcus and her daughter are sitting there, uh, you know, Pike comes by in his tow truck, and then so they're like, "We want to call. I want to call Sylvester." So he takes her, takes them to the gas station. Of course, they go to the exact gas station where Milton Burl is, and they but they drive out just as they're coming in, so they don't see each other. So, uh, oh God, there's so many things to, 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 in this movie. <laughs> um, uh, let's see um we haven't talked about sid caesar uh getting well, trapped in get the that. yeah that's, that's because kinda... it's all it's all contained into one thing i wanted yeah. to like talk about all that in there in fact i'm actually just about to get to that um yeah uh finch and uh finch and hawthorne drive back to find his mother-in-law and wife but they're not there so that leads to them trying to try to find each other and everything and meanwhile at some point they he, she does get sylvester on the phone and she tells him this rapid story. He's stoned, obviously. That's what they're trying to say, I think, on this whole thing. She tells him this wild story, but tells him to stay there because just listen to me. And, of course, he doesn't listen to anything, she says, except for the fact that she's in trouble. So he gets in this car. Now, in the long version, you find out he has stolen the girl's the girl in the bikini's car uh and the girl in the bikini is married so they're like having an affair of some oh, sort wow. and but he steals her car so that's what happens next he goes in there so you got three groups basically all converging on each other so the I, and so the crumps after they after they uh they miraculously survive this plane uh and everything they they need a pickaxe and a shovel so they go to this hardware store and so they they go in there right as it's closing and they go down to this basement to find the pickaxe and the shovel but the owner who doesn't know that they're in there locks the door behind them and then go and then walks out now they're locked into this basement and what follows is uh you know a comedy of errors of them trying to get out of this basement uh he tries a sledgehammer on the door um he tries to trip the burglar alarm that doesn't work at all um he tries to use a blowtorch on the doorknob and the blowtorch ends up uh setting fire to the basement this is where we and and then uh a fire gets started but it gets pulled out it gets put it gets put out and then they have dynamite down there the first long fuse that they put in there it's and it's an extraordinarily comically long fuse um it gets extinguished but it lights a box of fireworks <laughs> So there's fireworks that get shot down there. And then the second fuse blows a hole into a laundromat and they are finally free. So they end up wrecking the whole store, of course, because nothing uh, goes unfazed in this whole thing. Um, and the uh, the crumps end up getting a taxi driven by Peter Falk uh, by the end of it. And they are making their way to Santa Rosita. So then we have uh, Tyler Fitzgerald. He, you know, we've already talked about that. And uh, we've already talked about Carl Reiner. And there's that's where the 
Three Stooges cameo happens because they're waiting for the plane to crash and put the fire out and everything. We end up having where Sylvester notices Finch on the road. They get in a big, huge wreck. The Pike and the tow truck come by. So they all jump into the tow truck at this point, And then they go to Santa Rosita. Otto ends up flagging down Don Knotts, who uh, now I'm not familiar with whether Don, I know he had done, he know Andy Griffith's show was strong at this point. So a lot of people knew him about, knew him with this. I don't know if he was known for other stuff other than Andy Griffith at this point. I'm not familiar with that, but uh, he's done but, a lot of Disney stuff like, yeah, mm -hmm. you know, Apple Dumpling Gang and, and that kind of stuff. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, he was pr a pretty known comedic uh, yes. person. And he's playing, he's apparently playing one of his famous like characters in this, the extremely nervous man or something right. like yeah. that. Um, Otto once again tricks somebody into getting out of the car so that he can now steal the car. He, he, he uh, suggests that the helicopters following them, much like Ray Liotta and Goodfellas, he gets very paranoid about the helicopters. Uh, and uh, he gets Don Knotts out of the car. So he drives to Santa Rosita in this. Now Culpepper has convinced the whole police department they need to stay away from Santa Rosita so he can steal the money. And uh, and he and and then he's going to confront the treasure seekers. I don't know if his decision to go full crook was because the pension didn't go through or if he's always been thinking about doing this. I mean, I think it's because the, movie, the pension didn't go through. I, th I yeah, think the, the movie is pretty is is going that direction. Yeah. Yeah. The movie suggests that he is at least dreaming about being someplace else all the way through it but then he's he, he asked for that pension and that pension doesn't come through in an ironic twist of fate he is told that it's never going to go through because the politicians are mad at him and so he's never going to get it and then he goes out and he does he's going to he's going to do this crime and while he does it his captain actually successfully gets a tripled pension while he's doing this uh doing this uh th he's about to steal all this money and everything so uh so that nice little ironic touch in this movie. Um, uh, Ding and uh, Ding and Benji end up doing just enough to land and crash the plane without getting hurt. They end up taking a taxi. Uh, so now everybody is is has converged on Santa Rosita. Everyone looks for the W. It ends up being a bunch of palm trees that form a W. By the way. If you've ever seen The Simpsons uh, called Homer the Vigilante, they do a whole thing on It's a Mad, 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 Mad World uh, on that, where the Sam Neill uh, burglar tells them that there's a treasure buried under a big T, <laughs> and everybody goes and does this. They have scenes from the movie, basically, uh, that happen right after that, including the one where the kid waves to Phil Silvers as he's uh, in the in the car floating down the river and huh. everything bart bart is the kid in this in this version and of course they end up going to the t and digging up something that has absolutely no money um uh so so they're looking for this big w the first to see it is finch's wife and he and culpepper just happens to be in the area this seemed to like make the movie longer for me there's no point in her finding this first because nothing happens with it and I don't think anything could happen with it, even if even if that's the case, because uh, if they're, they're if it, she's she can't do it by herself, she's not going to be able to dig by herself or anything like that. And uh, of course, while she's sitting there dreaming about leaving the country and joining a convent <laughs> of all things, the other people find the big W, and uh, and so they dig this up. It's a suitcase full of money, just like just like Smiler Grogan said. Culpepper ends up revealing he's a cop, and he tells everyone to turn themselves in so he can just kind of make off with the money after that though they all pile in the taxi and uh they they figure out he's probably a crook because why would they let him let them off so easily and and so when the, so they decide to follow him and Culpepper ends up driving this car to a marina. This is where Buster Keaton shows up in the movie. If you saw the shorter version, this is the only part where he shows up in the movie. In fact, the longer version doesn't even have the footage. I don't think uh, it's no, just it's like some still frame. shots and then the audio of the movie. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so it, 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 the movie ends up kind of uh, taking him out and it, it kind of sucks, but you know, uh, it's kind of cool to see him show up in a movie in the 1960s. Um, when Culpepper tries to park his car at this marina, the taxis show up and he knows he can't hide. So he drives out of there. And while he went, once he drives out of there, he goes back towards town. And uh, this is where all of his cop buddies see him driving and they now realize that Culpepper's a crook and so everybody in the world is chasing him into downtown Santa Rosita 
And um, and uh, this leads to them to him running into a building. He goes up some stairs. Everybody follows him into the building. They go up on a fire escape. They there's too many people on the fire escape. It breaks off of the the side of the building. Fire truck comes over and tries to put this big ladder there. And the guy's like, not everybody at once. It can only be one at a time. But everybody, of course, they're selfish bastards. Get on the fire ladder at the same time, and they cause the fire ladder to start moving all over the place and they're uh the things that happen to them as they get slung off this ladder are hilarious <laughs> i mean there's they all should have died oh yeah but but the the, the it, i mean it's just hilarious like when we see the dummies flying out of the down from the screen <laughs> landing and everything in like lincoln's that. arms <laughs> yeah landing in lincoln's arms like a styrofoam <laughs> abraham lincoln statue um uh, i i love that whole sequence uh and then it ends in culpepper uh crashing into a pet store where he is licked by a dog one time but yes. then the movie backs and backs and forth <laughs> they either they either couldn't get the dog to lick him more or he refused to get licked more i don't know <laughs> one which of the one two. it is uh but uh it's an interesting it's kind of funny it's like funny to, it's like almost like they they did that in editing and they're like that's kind of funny and they just kind of left it in uh, and then so of course all of them end up in the hospital they're all in the same room of course uh uh bandaged up like mummies everywhere and Culpepper uh tells everybody that you know you guys are going to be fine because the judge is going to throw the book at me on this and i've lost my pension my wife's going to divorce me i'm going to go to jail i'll probably never laugh again and buddy hackett throws a banana peel onto the floor and ethel merman making one more appearance to come in and tell everybody i told you so and whatnot comes in and slips on the banana peel and everybody busts out laughing including Culpep at the end who's who's resistant at first but he it's just too funny so he finally ends up laughing and there is your movie i know they're, they're clearly meant time. to be like chimpanzees in a zoo in that like last year like yes. some of them are like hopping up and down like it's 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 you know clearly you know humanity is a mess mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, yeah it's, it's good stuff yep all right so what did you guys think i know that i know that actually talking about this movie took nearly the length of the movie to explain <laughs> uh i tried to keep it as short as possible but uh what you did do you great. guys think um i had a blast um it's it's hard for me to know who's who i'm just young enough i don't recognize yeah, everybody same here. um so i had to look up a lot of them but when peter falk showed up i was like i know that guy i know who that guy is i recognize <laughs> yeah. that guy um yeah i wrote down a few notes but uh, nothing super urgent that will make, change anybody's life uh I, I just wanted to note that uh the continuity of all the cars uh especially when cutting to green screen of people in the cars is astounding um mm -hmm. especially uh, when you consider it was cut down and a lot of that was you know they had to do a, a an edit from the the longer edit yeah it's yeah, pretty incredible I mean, it stuff. plays the the car work like an action film would uh really really impressed with that aspect that was maybe the biggest takeaway for me was was like how much attention and care went into that to make sure as often as possible, the car in the background is in the background where it's supposed to be when we cut to the inside. It was I was really impressed. Yeah, I, I love this movie. Uh, it was great rewatching it and also watching the longer version, which I'd never seen before. Um, when I first watched this movie, I knew I was in from the second Jimmy Durante did his Dying Man performance. It, it just <laughs> slayed me. And then he literally kicked the bucket and I was just like, oh, they made it for me. They made this movie for me. I, I get it. Uh, this is this is what we're doing. Um, in fact, my my uh, my college uh, buddies and I will often play the the treasure is buried in the uh, uh, you know moment for, for each other uh, as if we're gonna die you know before we actually reveal where it's buried. Uh, I think overall, I, I would sum up my love of this movie in the character work. I just think the character work in this movie is so good. Everybody, you know who everybody is. I I love Milton Berle and Sid Caesar in this. I think they are so good. Sid Caesar especially I just can't like even in the group scenes I'm watching Sid Caesar I love what his face does I just there's something about the way he performs uh that I really really like um mm -hmm. the Buddy Hackett Mickey Rooney pair is so funny together their character work is great um and all the way down the line Phil Silvers is a blast in this movie yeah, like once so he good. shows up he's so good and so fun <laughs> um my in my trivia reading I think it was mentioned Jonathan Winters it's his first movie 
Yep. It was the first yeah. movie that Jonathan Winters That's was in. Probably why he was able to injure that other dude so severely. <laughs> yeah. He just didn't have the experience. What seems to happen with these with these debuts is that they always end up in a fight scene and they end up hurting the person uh, in the fight scene. It always seems to happen that way. Uh, um, was there a, was there a favorite performer that you had in this whole thing? I for me, I think it's Sid Caesar um, mm. and maybe Ethel Merman. I think she's I think she's great in that role. She no, does exactly what she's supposed to do. Um, I was thinking about my favorite cameo and there's something about that Jerry Lewis cameo that I think is so funny. It's just like, j yeah, just driving over the guy's hat just because he wanted to. And then the laugh well, as the he's... the look he give, puts on his face when he sees the hat yes. in the middle of the street. <laughs> yes. And then he's like, oh, I'm going to run over that, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so funny. I guess in um, the original the original showings, the Three Stooges got the biggest laugh. That was the, the, yeah. the biggest laugh for people. And I get that, but... But yeah, that Jerry Lewis one is great. I did also read the thing about the uh, Jack Benny cameo that yeah. he was actually wearing a bowler hat in honor of um, Stan Laurel, right? Yeah, um, yeah. Because Stan Laurel wouldn't do it because he promised never to perform uh, after, after Hardy, Hardy died. died. So yeah, yeah. That, I thought that was really sweet. And, 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 uh, and, and I guess they're, I guess he's doing something. There's some movie he's. It sounds like he's doing a movie in that in like. Uh, that Jack Benny's doing because it's a very it's a slow creep up in the car mm -hmm. and he looks like he's performing yeah. something from another movie. I don't know what it is though. Um, yeah. But um, my 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 favorite performer in this is Jonathan Winters. Mm -hmm. um, I Love think it. it's yeah. I think it's just the expressions he does, especially like that when he's going when he's creeping across that rock and he's like he's like huh, okay are those guys <laughs> around there and then he's like. Ooh! Like, like his whole face and body like contorts and then the part where you know when he runs into the car has that wreck in his truck and there's like all these sounds that happens he goes he goes through like six or seven different facial expressions during that whole thing so i really really uh really enjoyed him i like everybody in this but the only uh, other thing the only other thing I wanted to mention was uh, on a sin brain level was they spend, you know, so much hilarious time for uh, Sid Caesar to to get their pick and shovel. And everyone just else just shows up with a shovel. Yeah, yeah. Like, exactly. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they just happened to have one or hey, you know what? they heard they heard that there was a, a secret opening in the laundry in the laundry mat that, mat. that would have been hilarious if they all made stops at the laundry mat and <laughs> to grab shovels that yeah. would have been funny but all right but, well yeah. uh it's time to come up with you guys's uh super secret double feature for this Ooh. movie so who wants to start be very very quiet secret what secret? A dirty little secret. I tell you something I've never told anyone. Well, Aaron wants to start. I guess I do. Um, you know, there are some because Jeremy still has to go. I'm not going to name any actual names, but there are some some you know obvious ones that were based on this movie. Uh, that I have, didn't choose Rat Race. If you okay, talk so about Rat, Rat Race, Race would be the, the primary among them. Um, you know, kind of redoing this kind of thing. I didn't want to go that direction. I decided to go with kind of the Mad Camp big cast of comedians with a lot of comedian cameos in a life or death situation uh i went with this is the end uh oh, as the double feature yeah. for mad 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 yeah. world kind of has that same energy to me like a bunch of comedians you can tell like working together and just having fun um and then there are of course a ton of cameos in it as well uh mm -hmm. with you know it's just kind of that group feels to me like the modern example of just like hey let's bring every single friend we can think of in here to have a good time with us um so yeah, yeah i went with this is the end it's beautiful i hovered for a long time on the road trip traveling chase aspect of mad mad world so i entertained road trip i entertained the hope and crosby road movies and I entertain National Lampoon's Vacation. All of those, I think, tonally uh, would fit. But mm -hmm. I ended up easing off of the travel aspect and going with the everyone in this movie is a horrible, selfish person. <laughs> and I'm mad at you, Josh Zero, in the chat for getting this out before I did. But Michael <laughs> J. Fox is greedy from 1994. Oh, greedy. Mm -hmm. Wow. Bill Hartman, uh, Kirk uh, Douglas. Douglas. 
Um, and it's basically he's about to die. He's super, super wealthy, and all of his offspring uh, come and suck up to him for days because they all want to be rich. And he's trying to decide if any of them truly love him. Uh, and a, when the, when they lose the money in Mad Mad World, and the money goes everywhere, and mm-hmm. the fireman guy comes up and says one at a time, and they can't do it. I realized it was, this movie is not about the money. This movie is about how terribly selfish these people are. Mm-hmm. And so that's why I'm going with Greedy. I think that's yep. a good yeah, <laughs> cool. good choice. I I actually love Greedy. I haven't seen it in forever, but Same. I love how that movie progresses towards its towards its finale and everything. I, I love. Uh, I I don't think it, if you looked at the IMDb, it probably has got like a five point eight or something like that is my guess. But it's uh, uh, it's six point three. But Rotten Tomatoes hates the fuck out of it. Thirty two percent on Rotten Tomatoes. <laughs> I really enjoyed it, but uh, that's a good call. Um. Okay. So uh, Aaron's turn to pick for uh next week what is the movie i had to do it um i i had to show the breadth of the uh talent the expanse of talent of kramer and uh uh of kramer and spencer tracy so we are going to stay in the 60s and do guess who's coming to dinner Um, i love this movie this is in my top 50 movies of all time even though i just saw it within the last few years for the first time um, this movie blew me away, so I'm excited to revisit it. And, uh, and my favorite just... part is when they invite the Klingons over for dinner and check off says, <laughs> Guess who's coming to dinner? Mm-hmm. Oh, so yeah, you've seen it, so that's part. good. Yep. So you've seen mm-hmm. it, so you'll be able to, to re explore uh, mm-hmm. all those all those nuances. <laughs> uh, yeah, so we're gonna do Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. I don't, this is a great this. movie, it's so good. I haven't seen it in forever. Uh, I don't see it on a current streamer. It looks like we may have to rent this one, which is fine because this one's worth it. Um, all right, uh, uh, we have obviously negative time for questions this week. So, <laughs> Chris, do you want to wrap us up? Yeah, we'll wrap it up, and you know, maybe one day we'll have a movie that we can just talk about in like five words, and then you know, move on to questions or whatever. But I'm um, sure next week it'll be really quick. Nothing, nothing serious to talk about in yeah, this one. At yeah, all, so. movies in the '60s <laughs> were so woke. Um, <laughs> All right, uh, that's going to do it for this episode. Uh, thank you, chat, for coming in and uh, being with us all the way through this. Uh, some really good uh, uh, double features in there, like uh, Cannonball Run and uh, mm-hmm. and Death Race 2000 showed up in there, so yep. stuff like that. So thanks, thanks guys, for uh, listening to us and uh, being with us here today. Uh, but uh, that's going to do it. This is a good, uh, uh, We'll see you next week. Guess who's coming to dinner? <laughs> Bye, guys. See Actually, ya. I think two weeks, what? right? We'll see people two weeks, in that's right. two, two weeks. weeks. That's right. We oh, are yeah. not doing one next week. Because um, it's Christmas for our recording week. Yeah. That's right. So, yes, it'll be in two weeks. But uh, anyway, we will see you uh, next time. Thank see you very then. much. Bye. 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 Be a part of the live show by being a member of the Sin Club at Patreon at patreon.com slash cinemasins. Chat with us on the CinemaSins Discord at discord.gg slash CinemaSins or CinemaSins Twitter at CinemaSins and email any comments or questions to recotopia at CinemaSins.com. That's R-E-C-O-T-O-P-I-A at CinemaSins.com. I'm reading an email from my insurance company. That, so I'm halfway through, but it sounds like they're breaking up with me. Oh, yeah? You got a breakup email from your insurance company? Now, this is my home insurance company, and they're basically, the first paragraph was like, as you may have seen in the news, the insurance industry is experiencing extreme pressures on multiple fronts, increased severity of frequency of loss, unpredictable weather patterns, and unstable reinsurance market have all combined to create a historic hard market. What this might mean for you? First bullet point, overall higher premiums. Yes. (laughs) Stricter underwriting guidelines, increase in memos. Yes, which includes, which means you need to show proof of remediation. Yes. Uh, and, and this right after a tornado nearly hit your house? Yeah, well, and I, I don't think that's a coincidence. Um, yeah, I don't think so either. I think they have determined that Tennessee is a tornado financial risk, and therefore my deductibles and payments are about to go up. And because I got this email, I'm not going to be allowed to bitch about it, but I'm going to do it anyway. Hi, Aaron. Hi. I uh, I had half a narration biffed by an accidental bump of my soundboard, which activated the 
uh, monster sound effect on my voice. <laughs> and you didn't know until you were done? I looked up. Um, this is it, after many after many years in audio, I always have my wave file visible somewhere. But but when you're narrating, you uh, you're you're zoned in on the script, right? Like you're reading through the stuff. And so I had narr I think I narrated, I don't know, a dozen dozen sins or so before I glanced up at the wave file and was like and the in and, and thankfully I noticed the difference in the wave file. That's another thing about being in audio for so long is you can see when something changes in the texture of a voice. And it was a little it was just a little bit louder and it was a little bit um stockier like the uh the uh the highs were a little more boxy than usually with a natural voice so i was like hmm something's going on there i was i thought my volume just got bumped or something and so then when i listened to it i was like oh no the monster the button got pushed and all of a sudden all of the the audio sounds like uh like this it just sounds like this so my entire narration <laughs> is just monster voice which, the funny part is, I was actually narrating about Rick Sanchez and Bigfoot at the time. So I, was, I could have been doing a Bigfoot voice. Who knows? Who knows? You could have. You could have. Was there a moment where you took your recording of that voice and put him out, put it out into the woods and said, Don't you see we don't want you here anymore? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> oh, awesome. <clears throat> so, uh, what's new? What's new, Chris? Mm, How are you loving? Dude. Are you loving being back to work? Uh, I mean, it's, it's sort of. I mean, I, I sort of lucked out in a sense because it ended right at the time where the holiday started. So, right, it's kind of a de facto seventh month mm -hmm. uh, in a way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, however the once i mean once we start writing again i'll i'll tell you when it what it feels like once to start writing again yeah um the very first script that i have to write is one of the hardest ones we've ever had to do uh, and i have been doing copious amounts of research chris chris wrote me the other day he said i've bought eight books on this movie or oh i'm sorry oh, okay wow I, I i bought four books on this movie that uh i'm going to read just to make sure i understand things <laughs> russia first invaded ukraine last last year whenever it first mm -hmm. happened yeah. i had a few days of of emotional like remembrance of the cold war and uh, some guy posted on the nashville subreddit um Okay, so Nashville, because of proximity to Clarksville, would probably be a prime target for nuclear assault. So here's what would happen if you lived roughly where Jeremy lives. Um, and here's how you could try and survive. Uh, and it requires so much duct tape. And then mm. spending weeks and weeks in a closet, uh, pooping in a paint bucket, mm -hmm. and then hoping there's not much radiation in the air when I get out, but there probably will be, and I'll slowly die of sickness. Mm -hmm. And so I remember telling my wife, <clears throat> let's just hug. <laughs> let's, let's, let's. Yeah, I think something would kick in with me, not even necessarily survival, but just like curiosity. Like, I don't, I don't want to mm. miss the next chapter. Like that, that chapter's, mm. you know, as painful as it might be, like my curiosity would be, can we do it? <laughs> can we survive it um mm -hmm. yeah you may not get to just be a spectator <laughs> what come on that's scenario. how the world works <laughs> <laughs> you may have to get involved aaron you may have to pick sides texas or california which one is it <laughs> oh my goodness speaking of apocalyptic movies have you guys what i'm sorry i just i, I want to pick your brains on movies which i guess we will probably do on a certain episode of the show soon but did you guys see the sam esmeal end of the world thing on netflix I forget what then it's like leave the world behind maybe leave the world behind i have not julia roberts and uh, mahershala so headlines about it <clears throat> okay ethan hall we'll save that discussion then i'm excited to talk about that movie with I you did, guys i did watch murder at the end of the world mm, i haven't seen that Ooh. i haven't seen that is that a tv show or a movie yeah it was on it's on hulu i guess it's uh an fx okay uh, it, it, whatever but uh disney it's all disney uh Right. I think it's, uh, I, I think overall, 
uh, it's good. I'm still thinking about that one. Um, but um, because it yeah, just we're all thinking about the apocalypse. It's on everybody's mind. Mm. Yeah, for good reason, Aaron. (laughs) 